Okay, is my mic on? Yeah, okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Jason Delisle. I'm the director of the Federal Education Budget Project here at the New America Foundation. Uh, and this morning we're co-hosting an event uh, with the Institute of Higher Education Policy uh, to mark the release um, of their new paper. Uh, I believe they released it maybe yesterday, the day before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or officially today, officially, officially well, right now. Okay, yeah. officially right now, it's on the it's on the table out front. If you if you missed it on your way in, uh, the title of the paper is uh, is delinquency: the untold story of student loan borrowing. Uh, and the paper examines trends in student loan debt, federal student loan debt, not private student loan debt, uh, using newly available data uh, from five of the nation's largest federal student loan guarantee agencies. Uh, and like I said, this is this is sort of new information that we haven't had in the past, uh, and the report uh, gives us a, a, a new look on the experiences of students in repaying uh, their federally backed student loans. Uh, before I, I introduce the panel, um, it's going to it's going to comment on the uh, on on the paper after Elisa uh, tells us what's in it. I wanted to make a few comments about federal student loans and, and the policy generally uh, and, and why this report uh, is meaningful. Um, many of you know that since the 1960s, uh, the federal government has helped students pay for the cost of college by making sure they're, they're able to borrow uh, on uh, generally favorable terms, that is low interest rates and flexible repayment plans. Um, so the, sort of the policy is to make sure that uh, anyone, regardless of their credit worthiness, income background, et cetera, uh, is able to get a loan to pay for college. Uh, in the past couple of years, there have been two big changes uh, with the federal student loan policy. Uh, one of them was very well publicized and thoroughly debated, uh, and that was the move to 100% direct lending last year uh, and phasing out the portion of the fe of federal student loans that were made through bank-based guarantees. Uh, so now we have the federal government uh, sort of directly in charge and administering all federal student loans uh, that are being made, although the, students are, the loans that were made in the past are, are, are still uh, under the guarantee program. So that's a, that's a big change. Uh, and, like I said, we've had the guaranteed program since the 1960s. The other change that's happened that sort of crept in that a lot of people missed, um, and it happened in a couple of phases, the, the amount of money that a student could borrow on a federally uh, backed loan w was mostly unchanged from the 1970s uh, until about 2007, uh, 2006, 2007. With the passage of, of a, a few pieces of legislation, the amount that uh, students could borrow uh, went up by about three, four thousand um, dollars for for freshmen and sophomores. Uh, and in in 2008, um, the passage of the Ensuring Continued Access to Student Loan Act, um, borrowers can now take out five thousand five hundred dollars as freshmen uh, and seven thousand five hundred dollars as as upperclassmen. Another change that took place in 2006, and this is the big one, graduate students for the first time were allowed to borrow effectively unlimited amounts of federally backed student loans to pay for, to pay for college. So now we have the federal government directly and entirely in charge of all federal student lending. And for the first time in, in decades, we're letting students borrow, uh, at least graduate students, unlimited amounts of money. And undergraduates were letting them borrow about you know, uh, fifty percent or even more than what they could borrow before. So that prompts some questions about well, what are the policies regarding repayment uh, and especially delinquency and default. If the federal government is going to make it this easy, in fact, we want to make it as easy as possible. That's sort of the goal of the policy for students to incur this amount of debt. And does the federal government have some sort of obligation on the back end uh, to ensure that students get the need, get the help that they need uh, to 
pay for the, to help pay their loans back. There's also another issue of what should the penalties look like uh, or what should the assistance look like for students who default on their loans or become delinquent. Uh, and that's sort of the, the crux of, of, of this paper um, that IHEP has put out and that Elisa is going to tell us about. And after she's told us about the, the, the data and the information and the findings in the paper, we'll turn it over to the uh, panelists. And let me introduce them first here. Uh, Alisa is the Vice President of Research and Programs at the Institute for Higher Education Policy. She oversees all the organization's research, studies, projects, and evaluations and programmatic work, and she is also the primary author of, of the paper today. Uh, we also have Justin Drager. He's the President and CEO of the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. Uh, he's the primary spokesman for that organization, and he has a, a long career in student financial aid. We also have Deanne Lunen. She is an attorney at the National Consumer Law Center, and she is an expert on student loan uh, borrowers' rights and responsibilities, and is also the author of a comprehensive legal manual on that subject. And we have Dr. Laura Perna. Uh, she is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education, and she is uh, an expert and, uh, and a scholar on how public policies affect the ability of women racial, ethnic minorities, and individuals of lower socioeconomic status, uh, enrolling in college, and succeeding in college. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Elisa to uh, describe the paper. Sure. Can everybody hear me? Okay. I'm really excited that all of you could be here. I want to uh, introduce my co-author, Greg Hinzel, who is also uh, a big part of this, so I want to just put that out there, and he may join in at as we go through question and answer, but um, as uh, we mentioned that we're from the Institute for Higher Education Policy. We're a nonprofit independent organization that our mission is to increase college access and success, and we usually focus on disadvantaged students, including low income and first generation students. Now for this pr exact project, I mean, I, when we started this project, I don't think we had any idea what to expect, what we we're going to hear, what we we're going to see, because there's really nothing known about this, and that's what's so exciting. Uh, we had read stories, a lot of stories about default rates. They're always in the press, especially recently. Um, but we also, you know, have talked to colleagues, friends, family about their experiences with loans. And most of them have not defaulted, but share stories about um, their experiences as they go through repayment. Um, I have to say, after this report went out, um, I think I, I woke up next morning and had like 10 emails from borrowers sharing their stories in a very lengthy way. So obviously it, it's not only, you know, us out here who are, who are interested in this work, but also people, just regular, you know, students who have borrowed and have various experiences. So um, I'm going to share some of the highlights of what we've done. Um, I think one of the, the biggest thing is is that as we have gone through and um, more and more students have borrowed and their you know their debt has risen over time, um, there's as we know kind of a lot of impact on the number of um, the defaults that have happened and we see an increase over the last couple of years. Um, some of it obviously given the recession, there's an impact there. But what is not identified by default rates um, are students who have difficulty repaying their loans on time but don't default. And so, you know, we kind of think of it as a false dichotomy between default and not default, when really we're talking about default, repayment on time, and then a whole bunch of students in the middle, or borrowers who are in the middle. And that's really what we did with this study. Um, so, excuse me, um, we're going to be providing a snapshot of borrowers who repay their loans on schedule, um, borrowers who use federal repayment options such as deferment and repay, or, I'm sorry, uh, forbearance to avoid delinquency, then a third big group that we've been thinking about, like kind of our primary group, are borrowers who do have delinquencies at some point but do not default. And this is, as you'll find out, a very big group. We also will give some highlights of the differences of borrowers based on some of the characteristics that we were that were available in the data set that we got. 
And just to give some highlights, and I'll reiterate at the end, um, just putting these out here. Think about this. For every borrower that defaults, we found two or more borrowers who were delinquent without default. Um, we found that a quarter of borrowers used repayment options like deferment and forbearance to avoid delinquency. Um, and those are kind of big, big, big things that we're, we're studying here. To give you a sense of where our data sources were. So we were able to receive um, student level, borrower level data from five large guarantee agencies. Um, American Student Assistance, ECMC, Great Lakes, Texas Guaranteed, and USA Funds. Um, and as a whole, those fi five agencies make up about two-thirds, or in 2008, they made about two-thirds of the FELP um, loan volume. So it's an awful lot of the borrowers that we have. It doesn't include the direct uh, loan borrowers, but still, we have a very substantial portion of the, the borrowers. Um, the, the data was based on borrowers who started repayment between October um, 2004 and September uh, 2009. But we focused on the borrowers who started repayment, repayment in 2005 so that we had the longest period of time over that five years to look at the data and the behavior of those borrowers. Um, so overall, um, the data overall was about 8.7 million borrowers. The group that we're looking at, the 2005 cohort, was 1.7 million borrowers, which is about 6 million loans and $38 billion in loan volume activity. So it's big. Um, now, in this data set, we were able to get the events of uh, whether uh, borrowers used deferment, forbearance, whether they were delinquent, or whether they defaulted. Um, we weren't able to look at some other things uh, about, for example, did they go into an um, extended repayment plan or um, an income-based or income-sensitive um, repayment plan. So that we couldn't get into that. And we also have a limited number of um, characteristics of borrowers, such as the last institution that they attended, um, where, uh, whether they graduated or not, um, the amount of the loan, um, the number of loans, but we don't have variables like income, race, ethnicity, or first generation status. Excuse me. Um, we also did some interviews, um, just as background for this study, um, just to get a sense out there with just not only just borrowers, but also people um, who work with borrowers on a day-to-day -day basis to get a sense of what they're hearing, and also spoke with some people in the industry, in the credit um, industry, such as the, the group that looks at credit scores and other types, so just to get a sense of where they see student loans fitting into the general consumer borrowing picture. <coughs> so the table two in your report, if you have it, I'm sorry if we didn't have a PowerPoint, but this is the biggie. This is the, the main thing that we found. We were able to use the data to come up with um, a number of mutually exclusive groups that are based on those repayment patterns and whether they deferred, repaid, became delinquent, or became defa or defaulted. And so we have about over a third, 37 percent of the borrowers were repaying on time. So that's good. They were using the system that the way it's intended, and they were repaying on time without having any other, um, um, they didn't have to do any kind of postponing or anything like that. But we have another 23% um, that used either deferment and or forbearance to postpone their payments uh, temporarily so that they didn't have to become delinquent. And so this is another group that's using what's available through the federal loan program to make sure that they did not go into delinquency. The third group, though, is the 26%, so over a quarter of the borrowers, who became delinquent but did not default. And this is the group that we really want to highlight because this is a, clearly a, a group where borrowers are having difficulty, but they don't show up in the statistics. People don't know about them, and this is the first time we can really define the scope of this group of borrowers. And then 15% 
in this particular data set defaulted on their loans. Um, so these are the four groups that we really targeted as we went through the study, as you'll see. Um, next, we also wanted to, in a limited way, look at you know, who are these borrowers in each of these groups. Um, and so we're just going to give a couple of highlights. There's more information in the report, but um, we're looking at both um, the last institution that a borrower attended, um, as well as graduation rate, which I'll, I'll do next. But overall, um, we found, and per perhaps not unexpectedly, that borrowers who um, last attended a four-year institution, specifically a public or a private nonprofit institution, were less likely to become delinquent <coughs> or default. However, we also found that a, about a third of these students actually did have, um, were delinquent at some point during this five-year period. Um, so that's, that's something that we found that people need to be aware of. Um, on the other hand, borrowers who attended two-year institutions um, for, and for-profit institutions um, were more likely to be delinquent or default during this, this time period. Um, so for public two-year institutions, more than a third of the borrowers were delinquent and another quarter defaulted. Um, but I do want to point out that at, at community colleges, a very small percentage of students actually borrow at those. It's about 10%, I think, 10 to 12%, depending on what statistic you look at. So that's important to keep in mind. For the profit institutions, we're talking about um, you know, over half of the um, students who attended, last attended these institutions um, either were delinquent or defaulted. So that's of concern, obviously. Um, the students who attend both community colleges and for-profit institutions um, are a different population than, that, than what attends four-year um, colleges in general. And we did not have the data to be able to explore that um, more than we have um, for this particular study. The next um, other characteristic that we were able to get was um, the graduation status of the borrowers in this cohort. We were looking at, again, the 2005 cohort. And again, as you might expect, those who graduated were far less likely to have become delinquent um, during this five period of time. And just to give an example, um, looking at the borrowers who were repaying on time, um, that was 48% of the borrowers who had graduated and 26% of those who had not graduated. Um, looking also at kind of the extent of delinquency, for those who graduated, um, there was 22% 20, of those borrowers who were delinquent but did not default, but then an additional 16 that did default. Um, but if they did not have a cred credential, um, those numbers were 33% being delinquent without default, and then another 26%. So again, more than half of those um, borrowers were having clear difficulty in repaying their loans. We found this pattern of, um, you know, if you graduated, more likely to not have problems within every institution type and every other cut that we had that was available in the data. So um, again, we can't talk about causation, but it is it is something that we need to be concerned about given the lens of college completion that um, everybody's really focused on right now. And just kind of to think about this as well, um, for those of you who got kind of a double problem, I mean, for those borrowers who, um, first of all, they don't graduate with a credential, and then they go on and have problems with delinquency, you know, you've got two things going on here. It's really difficult for these borrowers to actually pull out and do something. Um, and, but, it, you know, also there's the issue of th if they graduate, there's still a bunch of them who are also becoming delinquent. So that just, it raises this up to a policy level of, you know, we can't, somebody needs to pay attention to why this is happening. So just some findings to kind of take away from, and then I'll turn this over to my um, the other panelists. Um, more than a third of the borrowers in the 2005 um, 
cohort were re repaying on time. Um, and another quarter used the repayment options that were available to them to avoid delinquency. But, the big but, more than a quarter were delinquent but did not default. And as I mentioned, that means, because uh, there's 15% that defaulted, that means that um, for every default, there are two, at least two borrowers that um, were delinquent. And then when you take into account the <coughs> delinquent without default and those who defaulted, we're talking two out of five borrowers in this cohort who had, had been delinquent at some point during five years. Um, and you know, the thing to think about is um, you know, why are students' loans working for some but not all? And we can't, this study only can answer some questions, it can't answer all questions, um, but we think it's really important um, to really kind of refocus the framework or the debate about default versus non-default and think about those students in the middle. Um, and, you know, I just want to end my piece with um, a quote from one of the, the um, people that we interviewed that I think is kind of a, you know, strong thing to say. Um, and she said, we have an opportunity to give these borrowers more attention because if they get to the level of default, it will ruin them. So I'll end there and turn it over to my pan uh, other panelists and we can talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Maybe um, on, on that note, someone who deals with people uh, <laughs> uh, who default um, and uh, are delinquent and who knows their experiences quite well. Uh, maybe we uh, have Deanne Lunen uh, speak next. And, and maybe, Deanne, if you could make sure everyone um, uh, understands these terms of, of default versus delinquency uh, and forbearance and deferment, um, these are sort of these states of repayment. Sure. Uh, let's see. Which, I guess I can use this one. Okay. Is that, I have a loud voice, too, but can you all hear me? Yeah. <laughs> And it'll probably get louder as I go on on this because I get <laughs> passionate about it. But um, <clears throat> just a warning. So thanks, first of all, for inviting me to speak today, and also for the study, which I think is, you know, brings a lot of useful information to this debate. Uh, just just briefly about what Jason just said. I think, um, you know, for me, it's no surprise about how many people are in trouble. Um, what I do, not only. Uh, write the book and some of the other things that, that mentioned, but I do represent borrowers directly, uh, mostly in my uh, geographic area, which is in the Massachusetts, but I also have a national network of, of advocates who work with lower income borrowers. And we're not a big network, unfortunately, which is part of the problem, but um, we do see the consequences of the you know, student loan delinquencies and defaults all the time. And more recently, a lot of what I actually want to talk about today is I've been working a lot more with workforce development groups. So I see uh, borrowers who are at the point where they actually are usually trying to go back to school or trying to get to work and they can't because of a prior, usually a default, sometimes delinquency. Um, and again, the, the de delinquency versus default, um, there really is a long period of delinquency for federal student loans. It's uh, technically, by regulation, nine months for most loans, and I think actually in practice it's, it's uh, a year. Um, so that's a long period of potential for cure, which I think is, you know, is longer than you think about than private student loans are really than, than most types of credit. Um, and there are a lot of tools out there, as, as we've talked about, and, and the question really is, is why more people don't use them. So what I want to do in, in um, the time that I have is just uh, mention briefly a couple things about the study and then talk a little bit more about, through my experiences, where I see some need for changes. First of all, I would say, you know, if, if nothing else comes out of the study, I think we all should realize the limits of the cohort cohort default rate in terms of understanding the scope of the problem. And I think, you know, that's a fantastic contribution right there, even though others have, have written about that. And, um, you know, I'm not going to get into now whether there should or should not be sanctions on schools for cohort default rates, but the point, I hope a point of agreement that the CDR does not represent the full picture, the full uh, amount of trouble out there. The other uh, important 
point, I think, which, which Lisa mentioned, is how when you read studies, and there aren't a lot of studies, unfortunately, about this, but when you read about the causes of default, completion really is the most consistent finding, the lack of completion as leading to, to default. And so the fact that this study, you know, bolsters that point, I think even though we still have a lot of study to do, there is a lot of consistency around the importance of completion. I also would, would add to the study, in looking at delinquency itself, they, they mention in the study that delinquency intrinsically has its own harms. It, it harms your credit report, even if you don't go into default. And, you know, there are other reasons, uh, other problems. You might have late fees. You have other, other things that are happening to you. Um, but I, I would also say, you know, from my experience that um, we also want to look at delinquency and especially in and out of delinquency as a possible indicator of later default. Um, I, I see that with my clients all the time. So there's, the, there's not just the harm itself from the delinquency, but there's also the potential harm down the road if you go into default. And I know uh, you mentioned the point about default ruining people, and um, this is really what I will talk about more today too, is, is the consequences of default of federal student loans are so severe, more severe really than, than, than any other type of unsecured credit if, if you get into trouble. And I work with people who have problems with other kinds of credit. And so we've, you know, we've chosen that as our policy to have such draconian measures on the back end um, that, first of all, talk about the need to reform that, but also it makes the, the imperative of doing something about the people in trouble you know, even more important. Um, and then the other, the other thing I think that really comes out from this study is uh, how important it is to do more study um, and how this is so important and there's so really little data. Um, it'd be great to have the Department of Education data and the direct loan data and more information about what's going on out there. Um, a couple of things just quickly about the study, and then I want to get into more of uh, some of the reform ideas. But, uh, you know, one, one, I think, problem is, um, and it wasn't, you know, the fault of the, of the study, it was more of a timing issue, but the fact that IBR, income-based repayment, kicked in in, you know, 2009, um, I think we're really, uh, hopefully that will, as a reason to do more study because that really, hopefully, we'll see how much that affects, um, you know, people staying in or staying out of default. And um, that's now income-based repayment, as, as most of you know, is now available since 2009 in both the FEL program and the direct loan program. I mean, income contingent repayment has been available for a while in the direct loan program. It's been underutilized in any case, but this, this study is, is fell uh, loans anyway. Um, I, I also, and this is actually a question to think about. I wasn't sure about this, but I thought that, um, that, that the definition of active repayment in this study was payments that reduce principal. I wasn't sure if that was the case, but I, I'm also, I have a concern in general, particularly now when we do have IBR available that we don't demonize that tool for people who are very low income and if they aren't reducing principal, they're still current if they're making income-based repayments in some cases. And most of my clients, by the way, have zero repayments under IBR or even ICR. Um, as far as the deferment and forbearance tools that are available to people, I also think we want to make sure we understand the full um, implications of those. Um, deferment, for example, uh, in-school deferment, I know it sounds like a lot of the people in the study were actually were in in-school deferment, which probably skews a bit how you look at deferments because it's, it's basically automatic. When you're in school, you go back into deferment. Um, there's a time limit on deferments for the economic hardship and the unemployment deferment, three years for each. And those are the deferments most, most uh, commonly that my clients can use if they're not yet in default when they come to see me. But those are not, because of the time limit, they're not long-range uh, debt management tools necessarily either. Um, and income-based repayment, again, can be because you can stay in that. So it, it adds to the complexity of this um, to, to understand that there are some limits even to some of the tools that we think of as, as you know, good tools for, for debt management. So what, what I wanted to, to do also uh, with the time that I have is mention a couple of what I see recommendations and ideas that I see flowing from this report. 
Um, and, and the first one is, I think there's uh, in, um, almost an assumption in the report, and I think it's, it's something that we see a lot in, in other contexts too, that if only there was more information, everybody would, would, would do the decisions that we think they should do. And I'll tell you, um, from what I see, information generally is not the problem with my clients. Um, they come in with so much information in terms of written information, notices that they've received. I certainly can't tell you that they've read any of it. They may or may not have. Um, some cases, the envelopes are unopened. Um, and I don't, I don't mean that at all in a, what might sound like a, you know, a, a judge, to me anyway, this is not a matter of judging the decision making of my clients. I think, you know, we all often don't frankly read a lot of the credit information that we get. The difference between lower income borrowers in my experiences is the, there's no margin for error. There's no safety net for a lot of them. So if they don't read a piece of paper, <laughs> um, there's usually not parents to bail them out or sort of other uh, safety net to, to help them get through it. So uh, there's a whole literature out there about, whether, about financial literacy and, and, and education, and I, I'm not going to get into the whole thing now, other than to point out, um, I think we all agree more information is intrinsically a good thing. But whether it actually leads to behavior change and whether it affects the way people make their decisions, I think is really unproven at this point. Um, so I don't want to over, uh, you know, just think magically that would be the answer if, if people only had more information. It's certainly probably, we hope, part of the answer, not the only uh, answer. The other thing is, I think, and they point this out in the report, the why, why is this happening is really the, the study to be done still. And I know that um, it's not really a criticism of the report. The report is fantastic for what it is and says right in there, now we need to, to do more to figure out why this is. And a, a couple of uh, observations I want to throw out, again, from my experience of uh, why, why I think there are, to help explain some of the whys, why people are uh, delinquent, why people go into default. And one thing that, that isn't mentioned here, and I think people don't study much and don't really probably like to talk about very much, is that uh, borrowers who are at the point where they want to resolve a problem. So don't think about the history. All kinds of things happen to people. You know, the people who come to see me, are, some of them have been in and out of homelessness. Some of them have had, you know, major family problems. Some of them may be what, what people might think of as having made irresponsible decisions. You know, it doesn't matter. They, they've come to me now and they're ready to resolve their problem. And often the reason they haven't resolved it is because they tried and they were given inaccurate information by the servicer or often the collection agency. Whoever it is we've decided is going to be the go-between to help them resolve their problems. They've either been given inaccurate information, which I won't get into too much now because in the interest of time, but I'm certainly happy to spend you know, time afterwards or, or during questions to tell you about all the battles I'm having right now with the, the you know, Department of Education and others, frankly, just about telling people the wrong thing. Uh, when they're in trouble. So, so let alone reforming the programs, we have to make the existing programs actually, actually work right. Um, and, and again, I don't, this is not, to me anyways, it's not a matter of intentions, bad intentions, people trying to do the wrong thing. You know, I'm, I'm willing to concede that actually most people are, want to do the right thing or are trying to help. I, I just think it doesn't matter. What matters is what happens. And so, you know, this is what I see. I see my clients coming to me having been dealing with collection agencies and, and everybody on the FEL side and the DL side uses collection agencies as dispute resol resoluters or resolutioners and it doesn't work. Um, and I certainly again would be, can tell you more about my experiences, you know, having been hung up on and having to deal myself with collection agencies. They may be good at the collection side, not at the point where they have to go, you know, navigate the complex rules and figure out what's a reasonable and affordable payment, what are the options for people. So bottom line, when we talk about how we're going to get through this, it's not just, it's the inaccurate, it's also driven, the system is driven by, by a collection mentality, 
by conflicts of interest, frankly, because you have the loan holders themselves who are collecting, also doing the dispute resolutioning. I have to find a better way of, of <laughs> using that, dispute resolving, I guess. Um, and it's really, I think, the conflict of interest there that's at the heart of so much of this. Um, and in terms of a future area of, of study, you know, there, there's been some past experience of the, of the VFA experience and other experiences that have had some success, and I think we need to, to look at those again. Um, I know when, when, I, when I see which agency my client is with, I have a good sense usually of, of how far I'm going to get in trying to resolve the problem. You know, I, I have, nobody's perfect, and I have problems with, you know, I've had problems with, well, unfortunately, with just about everybody, but some are so much better than others, and I think we need to, you know, to build that in. Um, unfortunately, I feel like we all think, I think most of us anyway, think we'd like to see more grants, more scholarships, you know, less reliance on loans. I just don't think, I think there's a reality that loans are going to be with us uh, for a while. And so as long as we are uh, what I would say so liberal at the front end, and Jason pointed out in giving out these loans, um, you know, as a reform measure, I'd like to see us look more at, um, you know, outcome measurements at the front end and having, you know, having, having who gets to offer the loans linked more to things that we know are indicators of default, like completion and other things. But I think we've got a, you know, a big fight ahead of us to do more uh, at the front end that way. And so why isn't there more debate about what we're doing at the back end? Um, we know inevitably we want to, we all want to encourage access to education and we've chosen this way of doing it. We've chosen to do it, frankly, in a fairly lax way in terms of who gets to offer the loans. Why then do we have you know, a system where we take my clients to earn income tax credits, you know, and their, and their social, portions of their social security and um, allow them only one chance to get, to get out of default. And then if later on in their life they want to, you can't do it again. Um, why, why, have we, why, are we, why are we allowing that system to continue? I think we need to take a look at the back end, um, change those policies as well, not just for the borrowers themselves, but also ultimately because these borrowers have the potential also to be completers. You know, they're coming to me because they actually want to be on the road to success. A lot, most of them, I and mean, some of them are disabled and, and maybe really, you know, won't be able to do that. So I think that, that we want to do that both for them and for the, the financial interest. And lastly, um, to, to study this issue more. As I said, I, we're, we're trying to collect more data from our clients and ask them more from the, in their own words, you know, why, why do you think you went into default? Do you even know what default is? Which is one of my questions, and so far nobody has answered yes. Um, so, you know, we have, a long, we have a long way to go, let alone understanding, you know, the consequences of it. So I hope that um, what this is is really a, a good first step into studying a lot of those issues. Uh, thanks, Deanne. Um, Dr. Perna, you want to make your comments now? Um, uh, you know, Deanne raised a, a number of issues as well. For example, that uh, loans are probably going to remain the primary policy that the federal government has to help people pay for college. And and you know, it, it, is this the right policy for for all students? Um, it's it, there seems to be, as Deanne mentioned, there's a there's a a large body of work describing uh, the the types of people and the situations that they're in that we, we pretty much so know, um, is, you know, we're saddling them up with debt and they have a very low chance of, of repaying it. Um, so are there, you know, are there other solutions? Are there, are there better policies? And I'd be interested to hear your take on that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I want to address those questions. I first want to start by just commenting on the general importance of the report. You know, given the growth of, in borrowing and really the necessity um, of students to borrow in order to attend and persist through college. What is produced in this report is really important. We don't know enough about the consequences of borrowing for students, and this report helps address some of that gap in knowledge. I also, you know, the power and the, extens the extensiveness of the data, I think, are really noteworthy here and have um, really contributed to addressing some really policy-relevant questions. 
we have known from some research about um, research on willingness to borrow and how that varies across groups, as well as the uh, characteristics of students who go into default, but very little on these variations in repayment behaviors. The results are very clear and powerful and shed light on these patterns of repayment. The magnitude of default and delinquency without default, I think, are really striking. Um, so, the, you know, the report also begins to shed light on variations in the characteristics of students who, who are um, in various repayment strategies, as well as um, the types of institutions that they attend, and again, raise a lot of additional questions that I, I hope that we'll um, continue to pursue in order to shed further light on these issues and understand really what are the most important policies and practices for moving forward. I want to... Um, underscore a couple of important takeaways um, from the report. So um, as has been mentioned already, the, the data really show the importance of persisting and earning a credential. You know, that does improve um, these repayment outcomes. And that, so that um, lends credence to some of the current work that's going on focusing on completion more than just access. So that's really important. It also is noteworthy, though, that still, even for those who do complete, there's a noteworthy share who continue to have trouble repaying their loans. And so it's not only completion that matters in this. And so what is it? You know, what are the challenges? Um, is an important area that I want to comment on in just a second. Another noteworthy um, uh, outcome of the study, I think, is the variation in outcomes across institutional types. So, as is, as Lisa said, a small share of students at public two-year institutions borrow, but those who do tend to have trouble repaying. At for-profit institutions, large shares of students are borrowing, and a large share of these students have trouble repaying. Um, now, these are consistent with other patterns that we're seeing in the data from other sources, um, but they raise questions about, I think, for, for me, they raise questions about um, how well our current financial aid system is serving the needs of non-traditional students. So these are institutions that um, on average are enroll enrolling more students who are working full-time, older students, students who are attending part-time, have uh, weaker academic preparation for college. And so I think we need to think about, you know, if this is where um, a large segment of the new degrees are going to need to come from if we're going to meet some of these educational attainment goals that we have set. You know, how well are our current our policies helping these students get to where we want them to be? I think so. There are a number of data, and this has been talked about already, about the importance of information. Um, Clearly, you know, we need to, uh, students need to know more about the availability of deferment and forbearance as options, the negative consequences of delinquencies, the ways to interact with lenders if they have challenges, but how do we do that? Um, and this is a, so I, I've done some work thinking about how financial aids, um, various different financial aid programs and uh, marketing strategies are communicated to, inf this idea that Deanne mentioned about what are the practices that change student behavior is really critical. I do I agree. We have so much information that's out there that I think it's just too much. You know, it's the problem is to make it usable and actionable. And so that is what we don't know. So we don't know what are the right um, types of information from what sources provided at what points in time in, in ways that really resonate with students to be usable. That's that's really, really fundamental, I think. And then what are the right ways to deliver it? You know, we have mandatory exit and entrance counseling, um, but these data suggest that whatever we're doing is not sufficient around the, the communicating of information, translating into knowledge, which changes behavior. Okay, so, um, you know, when I see data like this, they always raise lots of questions. I want to know more and more and more. Um, but they, so I want to comment and just in a few things about what I think we need to know more about. Um, so first, the prevalence of, of borrowing here um, and the, the negative, the, the consequences of that are quite troubling. So I think we need to think more about how we reduce the need to borrow. And some of this is related to other policy conversations around controlling the cost of college, maximizing the availability of need-based grants and things like that. A second issue is thinking about um, the riskiness of borrowing. So we've talked about 
the negative consequences of delinquency and default. Um, so one aspect to think about is, well, are those the right negative consequences? Do we mean it too? Given how risky it is for some students, are those the right sets of consequences for us to be thinking about? Um, this notion of risk is consistent with a report that Larry Gladio and I released in 2005 so showing that basically um, borrowing pays off. On average, students are able to borrow and repay, get, complete their programs, get jobs, repay their loans. But borrowing clearly remains very risky for a certain segment of our population. And when we think about the changes in demographics and who, who we, again, who we need to be educating and having succeed in order to meet workforce demands, our current system has problems, I think. And so thinking about how do we minimize the risk of borrowing to students? Um, and how do we, and are there ways to reduce the need to borrow for these students who are most at risk of failing to complete their programs and understand how to repay? Uh, let's see. So there are other types of questions I think that are important. So um, just why do so many students become delinquent even at the four-year public and private institutions is really troubling. Why is the use of forbearance and deferment so low, especially at the for-profit institutions? Um, and finally, I think we just need to, we need to know more. We need to have more research in place to evaluate um, particular types of strategies and interventions to identify what works. You know, if we really care about um, reducing the neg negative consequences for the segment of population that has trouble repaying their loans, what is it that we can do? How can we learn systematically about the right types of behaviors? Thanks. Uh, Justin, maybe now your, your thoughts on the paper, but also um, since we've thoroughly described um, how dangerous and troubling student loans are, you can tell us what financial aid offices are doing to protect students. Sure. First, let me say uh, thank you to, um, to New America for holding this forum and uh, pass along my kudos to IHEP for an excellent report. I think it's breathtaking in, in the amount of data that's in here and provides new light on delinquency, which is the end pointed out is um, I think a uh, should be taken as a warning sign and maybe a trigger of some uh, high impact actions that can be taken to help students avoid the awful consequences of default. Uh, I'm here from uh, I think providing a perspective of the schools and specifically as Jason pointed out financial aid administrators uh, often uh, and this has been pointed out as well uh, most of what we think about student borrowing rests on a cohort default rate which is very limited in scope in telling us how successful students are at repaying their, uh, their loan obligations. Um, because the cohort default rate is tied to a federal student aid program, federal student loans, it often falls on the financial aid office who has no control over tuition, no control over federal aid, and really no practical way to decrease a student's loan um, it falls on them to try and control student indebtedness and borrowing. And so they're in, they're in a very difficult situation. And I think it's problematic for two reasons, um, looking at financial aid administrators as the key solution, even though I think it's fair to say my members want to be part of that solution, a key part of that solution. But the first problem is, as the uh, report points out, um, the students who are most at risk of falling delinquent and then defaulting are students who basically fall out of the program within the first year, um, who are um, taking out few loans, who are going to institutions that are uh, predominantly serving uh, low-income students. Uh, those uh, students really need a student success and completion program, not a uh, necessarily a specific default prevention program. Uh, I think schools that have comprehensive student success strategies are schools that are de facto dealing with uh, delinquency and default prevention. And so uh, there has to be, I think, a bit of a culture change in looking at the financial aid office as um, the only or even uh, the office that ha can have the greatest impact on helping borrowers avoid delinquency and default. It really has to be an institutional effort. Um, the uh, other reason why I think it's problematic to necessarily look at financial aid administrators or the financial aid office 
as the one-stop solution to um, what is becoming a, a, a greater issue for borrowers is um, the resource shortages that financial aid offices face. And uh, I don't mean to uh, tongue-in-cheek and say that other offices on campus are, aren't facing those same resource shortages. And uh, I know that some of my financial aid office budgets are larger probably than the budget that, that uh, you're working with, Deanne, in, in helping students, uh, borrowers um, in their situations. Uh, but the data that we have says that um, two-thirds of our, uh, our members are, are reporting a moderate or severe resource shortage on campus. And of those who are facing a resource shortage, eight out of ten of them are saying that they view it as a permanent um, fixture, not a temporary situation due to the economy. And the reason why that's important to look at is when a financial aid office is faced with staying in regulatory and legislative compliance or providing one-on-one -on -one counseling to borrowers, they choose compliance. When it comes to processing applications, financial aid applications, versus one-on-one -on -one counseling, they choose processing. And I, I don't blame them for doing that. They have to make sure the office is functioning and running. Um, and uh, the, the survey that, that we conducted amongst our members show that, uh, that the first thing that they're having to throw out when they are faced with these severe resource shortages is how much personal attention they can provide to individual borrowers. Um, the IHEP report showed that one out of four uh, of, of those borrowers failed to make use, at least initially, of any type of deferment forbearance that they were by all rights and means entitled to. These are tools that are legitimate tools for them to use to avoid delinquency and default. Um, but, uh, and we mentioned, uh, Dr. Perna mentioned entrance and exit counseling. For those borrowers, um, that IHEP has identified that are more at risk, those are the borrowers who don't go through a formal withdrawal process. They leave the school, they're not looking back most of the time, and so the financial aid office mails them information, but there's never any time when they're sitting down and saying, okay, we know you're leaving school, but here are your options to make sure that you avoid delinquency and default. So um, I, I didn't mean that to be like deflecting responsibility, but I think it, it, it raises a lot of, uh, the report raises, I, I think, the opportunity to discuss the fact that this is not a financial aid office issue. It's a national issue. It's an institutional issue. And uh, it's going to require institutional and, I think, federal resources to solve it. So with that context, let me move into um, some of the, the policy implications of the report from, from at least my perspective. One is, um, having just talked about resource shortages at schools, is that... Uh, for schools to do a better job of counseling, helping borrowers. And we saw this a couple years ago with schools that were taking time out and individually contacting students who um, were trying to take private loans. Um, schools who reached out and were able to talk to those students directly were able to present them information that led them to the safeties of the federal loan programs. Um, so we have evidence that this one-on-one -on -one counseling can have a positive uh, effect. But I think schools need some sort of resources. Um, I don't know if that needs to be institutional, state, federal. I don't know if it's a leveraging program or a block program. But I think there has to be uh, some identified resources that can go to schools specifically to deal with um, effective counseling and uh, outreach to students. The other thing, um, and I'd like to see additional research, this is one of the questions I think that comes out of this report, is what does effectuate uh, a student or a borrower um, avoiding delinquency or default, um, does a school have more leverage than, say, a servicer or a collection agency or the U.S. Department of Education in helping uh, making a student feel, a borrower feel that they're not being threatened, that somebody's there to help them? Um, I, I tend to think that uh, in my experience, and again, I think we need some more research here, that a school can have an impact if they have the resources to do it. Uh, given the conversations that are happening right now in Capitol Hill, I know we have to be practical, um, but it's disconcerting to see things like uh, administrative cost allowances, which are allowances that schools receive, financial aid offices receive to actually run their offices, um, seeing proposals on Capitol Hill that would actually reduce student uh, school resources even further. Um, it's discouraging, but I would, I would say we need to have a realistic conversation about the gross benefits of making sure schools have adequate resources. The second thing I'll mention policy-wise is the grant-to-loan ratios and limits. 
Um, we have sort of an incongruence with our, our grants and loans. And yes, yeah, we want more grants, but when you actually look at how the financial aid uh, packages and policies are, are created, we have a stepped student loan system. So um, when you begin your program, and yes, Jason pointed out that even freshmen can borrow um, perhaps significant amounts of money, students can borrow more the further they go along in their program. And that makes sense given the IHEP report, right? You would want the students who are most at risk at the beginning to borrow the least or not borrow at all, really. Um, for your low-income students. The problem is that there is no federal offset or step grant program. The Pell Grant, all things held equal for a, a family, mm -hmm. is the same each and every year. And unless an institution has a strong institutional grant program or aid program or uh, a robust campus-based program, there is no offset on the grant side for these steps in the loan side. Um, <coughs> the other thing um, that I've mentioned briefly was that Schools have no practical way of actually limiting the amount of debt that a student takes on. A student comes on and says they want to take a student federal student loan. Um, they can take a loan up to um, the cost of attendance for a graduate student, or they can take it up to that annual loan limit. Um, financial aid administrators uh, have some authority to limit loan debt on an individual by individual basis if they know, for example, well, they're going into this program, what's the, real, uh, what's the reality of them being able to repay their loan, is this in their best interest? But they can only do it right now if they can document that the student has no intention of repaying the loan. How do you document that? Um, so there are very few tools that financial aid offices have to, besides counseling, to, to help those borrowers. Um, so I would say that we might want to start looking at changing the way we look at grant to loan ratios um, even in the steps, but then also um, front-loading grants, for example, um, those are things that we might want to start uh, looking more in-depthly at. But also, um, if we keep loan limits, annual loan limits, low or artificially low, reverse it so that aid administrators are given the authority to perhaps increase debt for borrowers they know are good, candidate, good candidates to, uh, to actually repay the loan. Instead of putting it on the financial aid office to decrease the loan, make it the other way around. Um, the third thing I'll say, and uh, I don't want my ideas to go too out, uh, far out into outer space here, but um, okay. the, the third one I'll say is we have, um, as Jason pointed out, one loan program. And borrowers are now borrowing directly from the federal government. Um, it's a federal asset. It's a federal loan. And I guess my question is, uh, does this give us an opportunity to perhaps move out of a bank-based lending model? And what I mean by that is um, what we want to create is a habit very early on for students to repay. And I think we're, uh, you know, if the federal government can um, uh, require us to save for Social Security uh, through payroll deduction, can require Medicare through payroll deduction, can require federal withholding through Medicare, or excuse me, through payroll deduction, then is there an opportunity for us to, at least by default, maybe not force, maybe allow students to opt out, but at least allow a the repayment of a federal loan through a payroll deduction? And I think that allows a couple things to happen. Um, one is it allows the government to do an auto check to see if these students qualify for an income-based repayment perhaps, or it allows uh, the government to proactively see, well, this is what their earnings are, and here's what their loan debt is, and here's how much they can afford based on a, uh, a discretionary payment amount. Um, I think it also allows us to, uh, to examine um, perhaps the idea of auto forbearances. And yes, we don't want uh, borrowers to be kept on into perpetuity in a forbearance, but I think it's very striking in this report that all of the borrowers who went into default had tools at their disposal to avoid default. And there was never an opt-in to those tools, or excuse me, an opt-out. They weren't ever automatically moved into some sort of category where they would have to then come forward and say, no, I don't want a forbearance, I want to go into default. Um, <laughs> that I think is, is preferable, dealing with a federal, again, a federal loan program. So um, the, uh, the only other thing I'll, I'll mention, and it's been mentioned a couple times, is the focus on completion. 
Um, from a, a broad perspective, I would say, yes, absolutely, we want to encourage completion, but I'm very cautious, uh, somewhat cautious, I guess, uh, that we don't sacrifice um, access for completion. Um, tying financial incentives like financial aid to just completion, um, the easiest way for schools to increase completion rates is to become more selective or perhaps decrease um, institutional academic integrity. And I, I think we want to be careful about uh, introducing financial incentives that uh, to move schools in that direction. So uh, that's that's the perspective. Okay, great. Well, we'll, we'll open it up to questions. Um, I do want to maybe uh, clarify something. We've used this term cohort default rate has come up a number of times and maybe for the uninitiated we sort of explain what a def what default rates are and cohort default rates are and lifetime default rates because they're all different um, so uh, the cohort default rate is is students who uh, uh, leave the school or enter school a certain year and then they're tracked for a few years and the federal government measures what share of those students in those particular cohorts default on their loans. Uh, this is the the figure that's most tracked because it has sort of compliance um, and eligibility ramifications for schools if the cohort default rate rises too high. Institutions of higher education are no longer eligible to receive federal student aid. Um, this is something that's uh, few schools uh, uh, run into problems with this except for schools uh, that are in the the for-profit sector uh, and that's why it's it's tracked so closely there's another default rate and that that rates around seven percent so this cohort default rate that everyone's talking about is about seven percent of students but we're looking at about two year a two-year snapshot so we don't know uh, who defaults later on uh, the Office of Management and Budget tells us that for loans that are going to be issued this year federally backed student loans they expect about 17% of students who default at some point through that entire cohort of loans. In Elisa's paper, we have a different number. We have, um, maybe you want to explain how your default number is different than these other two that some of the, the, the policy folks are, are used to following. Well, a couple things. First of all, um, ours was over five years, which obviously is going to make a difference as more students who are delinquent go into default. Um, and in fact, I think I looked at some of the estimates that um, the department put out on their, what they would expect for a three-year or a four-year um, cohort default rate, and it wasn't far off from what we had in our report. Which is 15%? Yeah, it was 15%. 15%. Um, and so, you know, the other thing is that um, we were just looking at the FELT program and the total cohort default rate includes both programs so there is going to be a difference there as well um, we, we really focused on not really just the default rate we really were trying to talk about um, you know a lot of the students who are having issues repaying their loans and not defaulting so you'll see in the report that we're focusing more on that than the default cohort rate just for that okay, very right. reason that you talk about um, <laughs> Oh, one thing that a, a, a couple of the panelists mentioned, and uh, Justin and, and, and Deanne mentioned it, um, that you know we have servicers. If people use these phrase servicers, so the companies that are actually the businesses that are actually administering, processing the paperwork for students uh, and their loans, tracking them, sending out repayment notices, and, and collecting the repayments. Deanne seemed to suggest that. Um, the, the students get, borrowers are getting wrong or bad information uh, from these entities. And now we have, um, these entities are, are now in an, an entirely direct loan program. These entities are all contracted uh, by the U.S. Department of Education. Now, under this system, uh, there, there's a, multiple contractors, and they're supposed to be awarded contracts or, or volume of borrowers based on on some performance metrics, um, do you, and this is this is new. This is a new a new policy uh, as of last year when we went to 100% direct lending. Is this is this going to be a solution to this problem of, of misinformation? Uh, this new approach, or uh, has nothing been built in to in, ensure that? 
Well, you want me to start? Sure, go ahead. Or Justin as well, since you know you know quite about it, a bit about this. No, I, you know, I, I think it's a there's some positive things to that change, and and some of it remains to be seen. But I think the problem goes beyond that. And you know, if if I completely understood um, why wrong information is being given out. Um, you know, I well, I don't know what. I, I, let me put it this way: I do not completely understand why. Um, <laughs> I would say that I think it's a combination of, as I mentioned, as long as you continue to have that conflict, which you still have in terms of even with the some different performance metrics, um, in terms of how you're compensated, particularly in the post-default programs. So, a program like rehabilitation, where generally the the uh, servicing, so to speak, is contracted out to collection agencies and the commissions are tied to, uh, you know, the, the, the highest amount of payment you can get from a borrower. You know, that's an incentive. It's a financial incentive, not necessarily to go through the reasonable and affordable payment calculation where there is no minimum payment. So, so part of it is even despite these changes, you still have the incentives. And then I think part of it is honestly, most likely, um, as I said, I don't want to assign it to bad intentions because I just, you can't really get inside other people's psychology. But I think it is a resource issue, absolutely. There's often just, um, uh, uh, servicers and others are overwhelmed. They want to go to the easiest solution and often that's a forbearance, for example. And so that's what they do. And, and um, something like maybe what, what you were talking about with, with some of the financial, financial aid offices being overwhelmed. So I think that you know, having those performance-based contracts, I hope that we're going to study and continue to check them. I think, unfortunately, the, the complaint aspect of it, the element where they're being, um, the, some of the agencies are being uh, tracked based on the number of complaints has problems. I just, I think particularly with the more um, what I would consider, unfortunately, a more disempowered population. I don't think that they actually do complain very much, and we have to sort of be careful at how much weight we put into those and look at some of the other figures. But I think that that has some promise, and we should track it, but we still have to look at the, the you know, foundational problems. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else want to respond to the panel? I think, uh, I think the performance measures that are built in, as I understand them, um, since future volume, servicing volume, is based on how uh, good of a job they're doing with borrowers and, and schools, and then the federal government also has some input into that. Um, I think that, sh I mean, that would tell me intuitively that that would um, mean that we would have better information. So I, I, it'll be interesting, I guess, to see how that plays out. Um, the other part I'll mention is um, some of the conflict, I guess, when we go to 100% direct lending, um, particularly, I think, Dan, you mentioned guarantee agencies earlier. Um, some of that going forward, that conflict may have gone away. And I guess I wonder if there's – what is the future role there of some of those former fell players and providing some of these resources? So um, I, I guess I, I'm questioning policy-wise um, whether we can re-involve – if the conflict has gone away, re-involve some of these players in some of these efforts. Okay. okay. Well, I think now we'll uh, open it up for questions. Those of you that have questions for Elisa or any of the other panelists, um, just go ahead and raise your hand. And we'll maybe up front here first. Well, I think we've got a microphone coming from the back for you. If you could say your name and the organization that you're with before you state yes. your question. Uh, Jamal Abdelalim, a writer with diverse issues in uh, higher education. Uh, one of the things I was hoping you could touch on was just uh, making clear exactly uh, what are the penalties and consequences for, for delinquency, um, uh, which is, you know, I guess one step short of, uh, of defaulting. And um, once you clarify what those are, what are you suggesting be changed? in terms of the, the consequences for, for delinquency um, and, and penalties? Well, I mean, we discussed in the report a little bit about that. Um, you know, we did talk to some people. It's not, our scope was not to look into that in, in depth, depth, but I will tell you what, what we do know is that um, it's going to impact their credit record, their credit report. Mm -hmm. um, we talked to people in the credit industry who talked about a little bit if it, if it, goes into the, the credit bureaus, 
it's going to depend a lot on the behavior of borrowers in the rest of their credit life, I will say. So if they've been delinquent on other types of consumer loans, for example, and then they are delinquent multiple times on student loans, that will certainly impact very much on their credit record in general, which then impacts their ability to borrow in the future or the interest rate that they will um, find when they try to borrow in the future. Um, we, you know, so there are uh, problems there also, but keeping in mind that once you're delinquent, um, I think as Deanne mentioned, you want to make sure that you don't go further because the the consequences of default are much bigger and more serious than of delinquency. So what we're talking, what we're trying to say is if you can get to borrowers before they're delinquent, that's perfect. If you can get to borrowers when they're delinquent before they default, it's so important. Um, you know, whether it's information or some other way of having some sort of policy tool that can avoid that last jump. And there are financial penalties. I mean, there's actual penalty fees assessed well, yeah, on yes. the loan. I mean, I mean immediately. That too, yeah. Again, maybe you're right, and I was going to yeah. say also, and the balance is going to grow too right. if, you're, if you're missing payments and interest is accruing and they're probably getting late fees and other <coughs> fees too. Right, and the, and the fees That's are right. determined essentially by the federal government in, in what can be assessed on a, a borrower. Uh, other questions? Uh, back there on the, on the aisle. My name is Frank Paul, and I work for New York State Higher Ed. But I'm really asking a question more as a barber who was fortunate enough to attend uh, Dr. Perna's institution, and I still took 16 years to repay my loans, but I did repay them in full. Uh, and and my, my question, uh, it's really about the methodology, because I'm aware of several studies that covered loan tendering repay in the 80s or 90s, where the percent of students who never were delinquent was in the teens. And I think that number was pretty consistent. So I, to, to be honest, when I saw the release yesterday at 37%, to me, I, I thought that was spectacular news. Um, but I am curious also because we're talking about repayment begin 0405. So I'm curious how you handled consolidations in terms of how that affected the denominator perhaps and also, what was the definition of delinquency? Because you now some people would say it's 15 days or 30, or if it's guaranteed agencies, maybe it's more like 60. Um, OK, I'll answer your first question first, and then the, the second one. Um, so with consolidation loans, um, in, you'll see in the report that kind of our main table includes borrowers who also took out in consolidation loans. Um, in the appendix, we show that actually the numbers are not that different if you take them out versus keep them in. For the rest of the report, we actually had to take out the borrowers who had consolidation loans because of that, there were no flags, for, for example, for their last institution attended and things like that. So we were not able to uh, kind of get at some of the cons consolidation loan um, issues because of the fact, just the fact of the data that's available. Um, but what we do know, whatever we could run did not any, show any significant differences between the borrowers who had consolidation loans and those who didn't. So um, that's one piece. The second piece is that um, in terms of what's defined as delinquent, that was defined in the um, data that was provided to us. Um, so however they flag it in their data is what we have. Uh, another question um, right up front here. Hi, Lewis Sorge, Center for American Progress. So just a couple of questions, I think mostly for uh, the author. Um, one thing that struck me in, in, in going through the paper was that for a significant number of people who use loans to go to college, College is a very high risk investment because their likelihood of being delinquent is high, clearly. And I'm wondering uh, how do we characterize the nature of the purchase to, to, to people on the front end based on that notion? You know, we have some notion, we need more evidence about the characteristics of folks that are likely to be high delinquent because for those folks, it's a high risk investment. 
The second one is, it's m more about institutions. You know, given uh, the, the, will the demonstrated willingness or unwillingness of institutions to share information about the nature of their product they offer to students uh, by way of quality measures and things, they haven't been all that forthcoming. Uh, they also price discriminate a significant amount around enrollment management. In terms of, and so there's a lot of opacity there about the nature of what people are purchasing with the money they're borrowing. And so the idea that institutions would necessarily do better with more money to uh, clear up that opacity, that I don't see any evidence of that happening, so I'm wondering how you'd respond to that. Okay, so, so the question of, of, you know, are student loans inherently risky? I think there was actually a, a, a sentence in the paper talking about how they are indeed in, inherently risky. Um, and I, I had a similar question as well, and I, but I wondered, you know, are they more risky than other types of borrowing? I mean, that was sort of the question that screamed out. Is this, right. is, is this what we get when people borrow, period, any kinds of loans? Um, you know, we know quite a bit about um, home mortgages and delinquency and underwater and, 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 and all of that now. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a good question, but it needs that context. Um, I don't know that I can answer all of your questions, but I mean, I think one way that one way of looking at it is that it's a very high risk. But I will say that you know when we say that forty percent are having problems, we also mean that sixty percent did not become delinquent. So from that point of view, we can't we were not able to really get into a lot of the differences, as you say, of the people who are actually uh, taking out the loans. And I think there's an assumption that um, you know, some uh, borrowers are more high risk in terms of um, whether they're able to, because, you know, given their in income background or income potential. And so I don't know that I can answer globally um, about whether that means that loans are, um, because they, they have these, these things that we, that is so high risk that we need to um, kind of change everything. Although some of my co-panelists have suggested some possibilities that I think, uh, you know, something for further study. And, and we have said in the paper there are a lot of things we really would like to follow up on, and that's probably a piece of it. Um, in terms of whether, you know, I've gotten this question from other places, too, in terms of whether um, student loans are inherently more risky or less risky than other types of loans. And, again, we didn't actually look into that. Um, but... It would be a really good question. I think a lot of times when we're doing research in the higher education world, we're thinking about higher education, our little world, about student loans, and you know, the fact of the matter is a lot of people who are taking out student loans are also taking out a lot of other kinds of debt. Um, an interesting aside is that um, in the report you'll see that um, borrowers who were older in the 30 or 45 years old range um, were much less likely to become delinquent and you know it, it's possible or we can't say it but it is possible that these are borrowers who have more experience with borrowing just in general if they have mortgages or cars or you know other types of things and so there there is kind of an assumption here that people who know how to borrow and have done it are you know may have some more experience with the student loans as well anybody else on the panel want to respond just quickly uh, you know that as i mentioned that we do know at least that for other types of unsecured debt, the consequences of delinquency and default are not as great for student loans. I mean, they, they really, it really is unusual, extraordinary to have no statute of limitations for collection. Um, just really unheard of otherwise to, to have, limit, you know, basically very limited bankruptcy rights and to have all the government collection tools. So again, it might not change how people enter into the credit, but in terms of what happens afterwards, it's a huge difference. I just want to underscore, I think this question of riskiness is why this report is so important. You know, we have a system now where people have to borrow, essentially, in order to go, while many people are succeeding, successfully borrowing and repaying, a large share of students who have trouble is really problematic. And, you know, if, so, that raises the question, how do you reduce that riskiness? And we don't, I don't think we have the answer to that. I think we have to figure that out in a way that doesn't reduce access. You know, the easiest thing would be to say anyone who has any potential risk characteristic can't borrow and, the, and can't go. 
I don't think that's the way we should. Right, and you see that. everyone sort of going down that road in some of the discussions we've had here where you start to flag these things. And this is, I think this is a, a real tension with the program is the program is, you know, the, the point is to make sure everyone can get loans, but more importantly, those who are least likely to be able to get loans without the government program right. are, the, are the ones we're actually targeting. And it's that group that overlaps with the group that's going to have the most problems repaying. And so you can see that, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a real serious tension and may not have been as big of a concern when students could only borrow a couple thousand dollars a year um, in the federal program. Um, but now we've sort of blown the doors wide open, and I know that there's, there's definitely pressure on Capitol Hill to increase the limits uh, even, even further. Uh, so maybe we have time for a few more questions um, on the right over here, on my right. Yeah, I, I, I think you can hear me here. See, I'm showing a rep from Inchel. For the webcast, we have tens of thousands of people viewing <laughs> on the webcast. We want to make sure they can hear you. Well, that's, that's good news for me. But, but uh, first of all, I have a question, for a factual question, for a data question for Elisa, but I also want to associate uh, Inchel and myself with Justin's comment about... Uh, that we should look into using the uh, the resources of some of the uh, FELP agencies to uh, in the future in the direct loan program. There's certainly a wealth of experience and talent there that uh, uh, I think should be used. With respect on, on the, the factual question, data question for Elisa is, with respect to those borrowers who defaulted, did you look into at all whether or not they used the deferment or forbearance options before they defaulted or not? Um, the way that we actually cut the data in this particular report, you can't tell because it's a mutual exclusive. We just said if they ever defaulted, they're in this basket. Um, one of the things we're hoping to follow up with is to look into that, actually not just for that group but for all the groups. You know, what's the sequence of events? Getting really down into the details of what happens before and after, are they using these, you know, these strategies? before delinquency, after delinquency, before default, after default, and looking at that in a more detailed way. Um, we couldn't do it for this particular report, but I think it's really important, and we've discussed it among um, ourselves as well as others as an, an important next step. Uh, I'd like to say one thing about that. If, if, based on the question, if the presumption is the majority or even some are using a six-month grace period after school and then going 270 straight days and then defaulting, um, which we know does occur, um, then that, for me, is what raises the policy questions about now that we have one loan program and, and we have the federal loan program, at what point can the federal government step in and help students out who, for all intents and purposes, has fallen off the face of the earth and we cannot contact? Well, I think it's important to point out, though, that these federal student loan guarantee agencies um, they they have been involved with all of the loans in this sample. So even with whatever uh, talent and resources and expertise they can bring to bear in helping students repay, the numbers we see in, in your paper uh, reflect all of that, I'm, I'm assuming. That's what it seems like to me. So maybe I, I'm, I, I'm not so sure that, that's a, that the paper is an endorsement of, of their further assistance. It might even be... Um, a reflection on that that isn't the correct approach if the default rates and the delinquency rates are so high well that's kind of a chicken and egg thing in a way I mean it's like um, when we talk about Pell Grants and people say well we can't find any results from that but what happens if you take it away um, I think that and it's not exactly the same thing but um, given what we were doing we, we don't know what was going on with any of the borrowers that were in this group. Um, we know that a lot of the borrowers did use those tools. We don't know um, whether other borrowers should but didn't do it. Um, so I don't know that I can answer your question based on what we did with the data that we had. Uh, we'll take another question. Uh, all the way in the back. Uh, hi. I'm Daniel Lutzer from the Washington Monthly. My question is sort of a greater question. I guess in the last, say, half century, we've gradually moved toward a place where we finance higher education largely through personal debt. And I guess my question is, ultimately, does that work? I mean, can we make the individual changes 
as to who can borrow and how much and who gets access and who gets what information so that everything works out fine? Or is this possibly a greater structural problem? It's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, I, I think my co-panelists might uh, be more qualified to answer that, but that's never stopped me from offering an opinion. Um, I, I'll say this, that I feel like the answer to your question is yes. And I feel like it happened without a debate. That incrementally over the last 20 years, we've shifted from a societal investment in higher education to a personal investment, focusing the benefits, maybe under the rhetoric that these benefits are solely for an individual. And I think it's, it's a, a misguided policy that happened without any real debate, and it happened incrementally. So I think we do have a structural issue with, with higher education finance. And it ought to be returning back to an honest debate about what are the societal benefits and what should be the societal investment in higher education. I think that's right. You know, the, um, the other form of self-pay that is not part of this conversation is working while you're enrolled, and that's another um, type of behavior that, again, pays off for many students who are able to work while being enrolled and succeed in completing their programs. But for those who work a lot of hours and away from campus, there's a disconnect there that's problematic, I think, in terms of student outcomes. And we, I think Justin's absolutely right. We haven't had a, a good conversation. We're going down a path, increasingly a path of, of self-finance. I think that's problematic. Right. And, and like I said at the opening, that in the past couple of years, we've had a, a, a big increase in the amount of money that students can borrow through the federal loan program. But, you know, if we abolish the federal student loan program tomorrow, <laughs> Uh, students are still going to borrow. They're still going to get loans um, to go to college. Again, it's this issue of those who are, are <laughs> it's the students who are, are least likely to repay or, or may not have the income background who are, who are going to be the ones who, who don't get the loan. So you, you have this, this other issue. Um, we'll take another question on the, on the aisle all the way back. Thank you. I, I was curious for a distinction because the, and you just addressed it a little bit there, but the discussion around the lending limits by, for the federally guaranteed loans and the step process for subsidized and unsubsidized and the connection to direct lending or the FELP program, because under the FELP program, private borrowers would just use those guaranteed limits. So that really didn't change. So I, I'm, I don't know if I understand the connection between those two points. Um. No, the borrowing limits are exactly the same under under both exact, programs. Exactly. Uh, uh, my point was uh, in in relation to what Justin was saying, and the question all the way in the back was, oh, suddenly we have this policy where we're going to let people borrow to pay for the whole cost of their their education, um, and up until a few few years ago, the limits were fairly low, and most people are fairly shocked to to learn that freshmen can borrow twenty six hundred dollars. Uh, that that was the limit a few years ago, uh, and and now it's a few thousand dollars more, um, and for upperclassmen it's around six and seven thousand uh, dollars. You know, for for people's general understanding, that does not finance the full cost of a college education for a lot of people. When you talk about tuition fees, uh, room and board, uh, and like I said, many people are shocked that those are the limits. So I I, I try and keep in check this belief that. Uh, people are borrowing to finance the full cost of their education, but there was a policy shift in the past few years where the, the loan limits have been upped twice for undergraduates, and for graduates, we had the sort of unprecedented change of letting them borrow unlimited amounts. They can borrow up to their full cost of attendance, so it's not unusual now. <laughs> but not under the guaranteed program. Uh, the limits are pretty defined. I mean, it's 3,500. I mean, I'm looking at the list right now for first year for subsidized and unsubsidized throughout, so... right. Um, you know, right. First Those are the student. limits for undergraduate students. It's the same in the direct loan program and the guaranteed program. Exactly. And in the but Grad Plus program, loans were made starting July 1, 2006, when the guaranteed loan program exists. Borrowers in, any, in either program, direct loans or guaranteed, could borrow through the Grad Plus program for their full cost of attendance. Actually, the cap is 9500 for the first year. For, the, for Grad Plus loans. For this is Grad Plus loans. Okay, you can borrow your full cost okay. of attendance as a graduate student. Uh, we've got time for one more question uh, here in the front. Uh, 
Dale Lorth from Senator Rockefeller's office. Since we're talking so much about amounts, I wonder, Elisa, did you study the connection between the amount borrowed and their likelihood of default? And, and then as a side question, if so many borrow for one year, fall out, are the ones contributing to delinquency or, and default, does that mean for three, four, maybe $5,000 they're being ruined? Well, to, to answer, and maybe people will also answer, but the, uh, we did look at kind of the correlation between loan amounts and number of loans and whether they were delinquent or defaulted. And um, interestingly, and maybe counterintuitively, um, the borrowers with the lower amounts of loans actually were more likely to have been, become delinquent and defaulted. Um, and vice versa, and we saw some of our kind of um, those who are repaying on a timely b basis are often graduate students, and so if you're thinking about that, you know they have lots of loans, and yet they're we in our data it showed that they were way more likely to be repaying on time or using deferment or forbearance, and I think and maybe Laura can add uh, the research that I've seen on on default kind of suggests the same time the same thing. I mean, oftentimes you're talking about um, borrowers from disadvantaged areas, and they may be going to community colleges or they may not. They may leave um, early, and so they're not, they haven't taken out a lot of loans. And so that, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons that may be true, but that's what we saw in our data. I don't know if anybody wants to add. No, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and mean, it was a little bit counterintuitive that the, yeah. this, the, the less you borrow, uh, the more likely you are to default, but as you say, this is, sort of, this is of, yeah. correlated with a lot of other things and it's hard to disentangle Exactly. Uh, so we'll have to leave it there. Uh, thank you all for attending. We, we'll thank the panelists. Uh,